Joan, for that really nice introduction, and I thank the review committee for this award. I think I'm more nervous than I was when I did my defense because of the um, great qualitative thinking I know that's in this room, and certainly in all the people that uh, trained me and brought me to this place in my work. Um, in some ways, my presentation follows on from that that was of the first speaker in the CQ series in September. So anybody who was here would have heard Melanie Rock talk about the indispensability, as she called it, of texts in qualitative research. And I think, and I hope by the end of my presentation you'll agree, although I'm going to take a slightly different take on how I use texts. But she spoke about the active analysis of text what the document says, what it's made to say, and what's brought into view as a result of the analysis of texts. And so it's not just looking at the documents themselves, but it's actually looking at the context within which those documents are produced and reproduced over time. And I think that certainly my work also follows along some of that line. And Joan at the time asked a really interesting question about texts and how they interact with people. And she actually asked a chicken or egg question, which comes first, the text or the people interacting with it? I don't know that I can answer that, but that question has sort of stayed in my mind, and you can see whether that's pertinent to the work that, that I'm going to describe. In finalizing my thoughts for this presentation today, I came across a really interesting article by a, a writer I don't normally read in the Globe and Mail, because I don't like his work. But he was talking about something. What caught my eye was this notion of something called the three-minute the Three Minute Dissertation Award. Very different from the award I've been given because the idea is that you should be able to talk about your thesis in three minutes or less. And in that, he used that as a platform actually to talk about the idea about whether new and difficult ideas can be delivered in such a truncated way. And what I liked about what he said was he suggested that it's the very fluidity of concepts, especially in the social sciences and humanities, um, that resist, and their resistance to the explanation of everyday language that makes them actually useful. And I want to underscore that. It's what makes them useful. So in this day and age when everything has to be useful, I want to make an argument that analyzing discourses and how people interact with them is actually a useful enterprise. And you'll tell me whether I've convinced you or not. In that same piece, he also referred to a website called Dissertation Haikus. And this is another attempt to, and it's, it's again, it's a, it's a website you can go to and people boil down 260 pages to a Japanese form of poetry called a haiku, which has a particular form that it has to take. And so when I was thinking about this, I was thinking, can I develop a methodological haiku for this presentation? <laughs> and what he did was he, I mean, in, on this site it talks about uh, dissertation as being long and boring. And so the author of the article I was reading said that these haikus were actually uh, an example of simplification and condensation taken to its extreme. And rhetorically at the end of the piece he says, why bother with thesis if we can have haikus and they can tell us everything we know. So I want you to think about when I get to the end of this, why bother with methodology chapters? Maybe we can just do a haiku. Um, because haikus really tell, or methodology chapters really tell the story, uh, a, a good methodology chapter tells the story of the study. And I'm borrowing that from Denise Gestaldo, who tells her students that um, it's the story of the key and decisive moments in the development of the study which have influenced the final format and the results that are presented. And I think that's very, very much in keeping with what I learned to do. But my work also borrows from a, the a theorist named Irving Goffman, who was a sociologist, um, who published a book called Presentation of Self in Everyday Life in 1959. And it's actually his work and his theory about everyday life being a form of drama that I actually draw drew on for most of my thesis. So I'm going to be talking about him a little bit and uh, how he inspired my methodological thinking. So this is what he said. So you have my haiku. This is what he said about what a performance is. A performance might be defined as all the activity of a given participant on a given occasion which serves in any way to influence any of the other participants. So that's pretty simple. So I, what I want to say to you is that this presentation that I'm giving today is 
a type of performance according to that definition. I'm trying to influence you, and you'll see a number of things that I want to influence you to think about. And whether or not my performance comes off will depend on a lot of things. The strategies that I'll use to convince you of my analysis, whether or not there are any disruptions or embarrassments because I don't manage to pull it off. And most importantly to my work is to talk a little bit about the work that language actually does. And so, the abstract, which is a more familiar way that most of us um, have of abstracting from a potentially long and boring dissertation, to consider some of the promises and the intentions that I have today in what I want to bring to you. And I think most of you probably saw this abstract. I don't intend for it to be read. I just wanted to show that this is yet another version of trying to condense a very large piece of work into a manageable idea. So as Joan said, most of what I'm going to do today is to talk about methodology, but I think that there has to be some background in the substantive focus of my work because you need to understand why I looked at this in this way, how it influenced what I found, and I put found in sort of quotation marks, and what some of the implications might be or the consequences of looking at this study in this particular way. <coughs> I also hope that what will happen out of this presentation is that you'll come away with some idea of how to transfer, methodologically transfer, some of the implications of my work into your own field of study. But to do that, you have to listen to me talk a little bit about my thoughts about children, risk, mental health, ill parents, and so on. So Joan gave you a bit of a rundown about my background. So those experience and sort of a traditional review of the literature led me to want to study um, the effective, effectiveness of support groups for kids whose parents have mental health problems. But what I became really intrigued by was that any groups that had actually been measured for their effectiveness would, would, would tend to look at as whether the children met the goals of the program and those goals were defined by adults who had created them. So rather than looking, rather than seeking to understand the children's responses solely through observing their interactions in the group, I developed a conceptual framework drawing on what I eventually called critical dramaturgy to observe their performances in response to a script that I thought was designating what was expected of them in this group. But my goal was to study a children's support group in an in innovative way, not for its own sake, but to understand how it was helpful to the kids that were in that program and to consider what might make it better. So my talk today is going to, I'm going to briefly talk a little bit about my approach to the study uh, and just a very brief um, introduction to symbolic interactionism for those who may not know about it and how that influenced the conceptual framework I developed leading to particular research questions that I had. I'm going to talk a little bit very briefly about method and strategy which I distinguish between from methodology. And then I want to spend the bulk of my time talking about my critical discourse analysis, what I did, what I found, and then very briefly, a little bit about the observations I made in the group and how the children and the adult participants actually responded to that script. I know there's some people who have to leave at one for classes, so I won't be offended if you disrupt my show and have to leave, not a problem. So, shaping my, the approach to my study were the key contributions of George Herbert Mead, Bloomer, and the influences that their thinking around symbolic interaction had on Goffman's work. And Goffman, as I think I've already said, conceptualized social life and social interaction as a type of performance. Symbolic interaction assumes that ascribing meaning to behavior and things is central to human life shaping how we interpret uh, things that we're doing ourselves, the events around us, the environments, and other people and their interactions with us. These interpretations are said to influence how people respond to situations regardless of the objective reality of the situation itself. The creation of meaning is central to symbolic interaction because, and, and meaning is considered dynamic so that it's, it changes in, in social processes of interaction um, as individuals develop new understandings about things or about phenomena. 
and the enactment of power between those engaged in social, social interaction is also an important aspect of developing meaning. So George Herbert Mead said that differing attitudes and beliefs coalesce around the use of symbols that are significant to those involved, and symbols include words, actions, images that signify the meaning of behavior to everybody involved. Gestures or signs are integral to symbolic interactions, assertion that individual actors take on or imagine the role of the other and interpret or define others' actions and perform and respond on the basis of these interpretations. So using these ideas, I conceptualize children in my study as actively involved in interpreting, defining, and evaluating their own and others' actions and interactions in the children's group. All the names that I use are pseudonyms too, so for confidentiality reasons. So critical dramaturgy has its roots in symbolic interaction, strongly influenced by Goffman's conceptualization of any face-to-face -face encounter as dramaturgical. And he described that as the reciprocal influence we have on one another's actions when we're in each other's immediate physical presence and that our beliefs and interpretations about phenomena are influenced by social intercourse as we attempt to manage how we and others respond to a specific situation. So I conceptualize the support group as a type of performance in which meaning arose out of the child or the children and the adult participants interaction with each other so that the performance was handled in and modified through a joint interpretive process within which the participants sought to influence each other. So I was interested in observing that. I also drew on core dramaturgical concepts that Goffman talks about, particularly this idea of the art of impression management. So performers practice these three things, loyalty, discipline, and circumspection. Loyalty, the idea of loyalty is that the group that is that group solidarity is based on a moral obligation that people have for one another in the setting. They have to exercise discipline, showing restraint in their performance and expressive responsibility for one another, <coughs> remembering that they have a part to play in the interaction, and that they have to learn to trust their own performances and one another's performances. The third feature of the, the art of impression management, uh, Goffman talked about um, practicing circumspection. So that is determining in advance how to best stage a show and prepare for unseen events and practice routines under manageable circumstances. So critical dramaturgy for me was made up of, of being able to discuss all of these different features and how they were going to play out in this group. But by critical, I, I was referring very specifically to power in terms of performers' strategies to influence, manage, manipulate, and control information. And Goffman called this strategic interaction, so it was a very particular kind of interaction, because performers use calculated measures to, prefer, to prevent embarrassment or disruption to the show that they're trying to put on. But. Um, by power, I was also referring to what I came to call the institutionalized expectations of interactive settings. The rules, the beliefs, the norms, and many of these things are implicit, that frame how we're supposed to think, feel, and act in regards to something. And I'm just going to read very briefly uh, something that Goffman said about institutionalized expectations, and it's mixed in a bit with how other authors have interpreted that. Shared institutionalized meanings come from frames of reference or definitions of a situation that are built up in accordance with principles of organization which govern events, at least social ones, and our subjective involvement in them. And Goffman tended to talk about frames of reference or framing things. He was writing in a time long before we talked about discourse analysis. Um, he said, frames direct attention to which part of a reality we notice, facilitating cognitive exchange of shared experience. Because institutionalized expectations and practices frame interactive settings, macro forces 
can bind and shape actors at the micro level. Presentations of self are in part products of structural power even if the actor is unconscious or only dimly aware that this is part of the business that he or she is in. So this, being able to see, see a lot of Goffman's work and the work of the interactionist was considered lacking in any attention to power. And so when I was first working with my committee, um, I was told, you know, you really have to contribute to theoretical thinking by finding something new to talk about. And I, when I saw this crit criticism in the literature about um, interactionist work lacking any notion of power, I was quite shocked because I had become very aware of Goffman's ideas about influence and manipulation and all of that. But when I looked at his later work, and it was around, I think, the 70s that he started talking about framing, I realized, and because I was going to school at a time when discourse was being talked about a lot more, I could make the connection between those things much more easily. So by discourse, I mean a group of ideas or a patterned way of thinking that's identifiable in textual and verbal communications, but often located in wider social structures. But also, and I draw very much on Faircloth's early work in 1992, where he talked about the constructive effects of discourse. So we can know discourse by looking what it, at what it does. That the constructive effects of discourse are evidence in the, evident in the way they contribute to the construction of social identity and social relations. And also, how they contribute to knowledge and belief systems. And you'll see how this actually became what I wanted to look at in the program manual of the, of the group I studied. There are lots of versions of discourse analysis, even lots of versions of critical discourse analysis, but one of the, the I think the common assumptions amongst most people analyzing discourse is that language produces and constrains meaning, the social world can only be accessed and interpreted through language, and therefore the social world can only be studied through an approach that explores the work that language does. So language is seminal. But the idea is that language is not politically neutral. So it doesn't just convey, convey information. It's highly symbolic in the way that it shapes an issue or a phenomenon. Language does things. So in this sense, language is performative. And the analyst's job is to reveal what some of those underlying assumptions are. It's showing in particular how the use of metaphors, rhetorical strategies, analogies, phrases, images, shape the betrayal of information. And how these ideas and pattern ways of thinking are often imported from somewhere else. So if you think of the idea of a metaphor, a metaphor usually stands in for something else. So it's, it's, it's actually saying one thing while drawing on something quite different often. So I was interested, because of this, this burgeoning interest in discourse, I was interested in looking how, at how discourses were playing out in my work. But you know, I didn't want to just look at any kind of discourse. It would have taken me years to complete. So what I did was I looked particularly at how mental health and illness are talked about in the discourse out there. And I also was interested in how people talked about what it meant to be a child in the discourse out there because these things would frame the expectations in this group. So I outlined how these three dis these discourses were described in publicly available documents at the time. So I'm not talking about analyzing my own, the documents from my study, I'm talking about just looking at public documents prior to even doing any analysis to see how these things were talked about. So for example, I looked at the Public Health Agency of Canada and how they talked about these three things. I looked at the Center for Addiction and Mental Health Canadian Mental Health Association, and I looked at policy documents outlining new strategic directions for child and youth services. And in this slide, I kind of refer very basically to some of the ideas I saw out there, which are, you know, um, metaphors for, the, met, uh, for the, in the, the broken brain as a metaphor for mental illness, um, the idea of control, responsibility, and resilience, certainly in the mental health and mental health promotion area and the child as a preparatory phase of, of, of life where um, adults have particular responsibility for um, protecting them and preparing them for an adult future. 
all of this led to my research questions. And of course, as, as most of you will know, either because you've done this or because you are about to do it, the research questions in this kind of work change as you analyze data and get to know a little bit more about what you're actually asking. So I'm presenting in very linear, linear, linear fashion as if I did all of this and I arrived here. It wasn't, it was very, very messy compared to that. So these were my questions and, and again I was really interested in knowing how the support group affected the kids, what they knew, what they felt, what was expected of them in terms of their behavior, all because they were children of parents with mental health problems. And then of course I was interested in how they responded to the group. So that, those were the two big questions I had and, and, uh, and those were the two things that drove the study, the two questions that drove the study. I want to really briefly refer to the techniques and strategies I used because I want to talk more about methodology and, and what I actually did as a result of this methodology I'm describing. But just to keep us, to keep us on, uh, on, on track in terms of what I did, basically it was a participant observation study. Um, I was probably less participant and more observer, although I think that's a really interesting continuum and it's very hard to see where you actually sit on that. Um, I was a participant in the sense that I took notes during the group. Um, I participated in activities that were fun, but I didn't participate in any activities where they were about having a mentally ill parent because I couldn't do that in an ethical way, I felt. Um, I had read a lot about debates about adults participating in kids' settings, and I won't go into that, but that also affected how I thought about my participation in the group. One of the interesting things is one of the kids <clears throat> had a really, uh, she wanted to be a writer <clears throat> and she had a great um, skill and interest in naming us. So she'd often throughout the course of the group name us different things. And my name was seen but not heard. <laughs> so I think that's an interesting comment on me as a participant observer. I also think it's a very beautiful comment on an adult because it, it's mm -hmm. usually the reverse that we, we think about those things. The other technique that I used that I really enjoyed was something I call interviewing by comment. So I never formally sat down and interviewed these kids. I just I observed in the group and participated in the group to some extent. But I was able to elicit some information from them by making comments on things that they were doing when it was appropriate, when I wasn't disrupting the, the facilitators. So for example, one of the kids, his name was Colin, he had a reaction to a particular book. They had a little area where the kids could read books. And this book was called My Father is Crazy. And of course he objected, <clears throat> and he was very articulate, and directed, uh, objected very violently to this, to this title. So I was able to say to him, well, if you were writing a book, what, what would you call it? And this started a whole round of interaction around writing books and what would we say if we could talk to people out there about our situation. So <clears throat> that's a kind of an example of in, informal interviewing that I, that I really found helpful. I held a group discussion at the very end, after all the group was finished, just to ask the kids quite directly what they thought about the group. And then other sources of data, um, and the major source of data that I used was the program manual. So what happened was, I had already started coding my data and, and looking for themes and, and that kind of stuff that we do in fairly traditional analysis of the observations I had made during this group. And I was having a hard time trying to understand what was expected of the kids. Like I had, I had all kinds of codes about being performers and stage directions and different sort of theatrical terminology and it sort of dawned on me, but I didn't know what the script was for this, for this performance. So I realized I'd been given this program manual um, by the facilitators just to help me know what was going to happen every, every uh, session. And so I ended up doing a discourse analysis of that manual, which sounds simple standing here, but what happened was I had to actually teach myself what discourse analysis was. Um, it wasn't in the plan originally, and it came to me because it felt like a necessary analytic step I had to take. Uh, written field notes, pretty traditional written field notes, constituted the primary data for the study. It described the participants, the setting, their interactions, what people said and did, documents, personal experiences I had in the group, um, any event I could observe. My notes were really messy and I was really happy about that because the kids tried to read it 
I'd read the notes. And it wasn't that I didn't want them to know it was in there, but I wanted to protect one of the confidentiality issues between group, group members. The other thing that I did, which was a bit serendipitous, was I, I produced what I ended up calling photographic field notes. I didn't have any permission to use a camera in the study for my REB, but I took a camera and I photographed everything but people. And you'll see if I, I'm hoping to get to it, I actually was able to use some of those photographs of different activities and artwork and that in my analysis. So it was, it was very helpful. The transcriptions um, of my written field notes in the field actually took me eight hours to do, three hours of observation. But in keeping with my metaphor, my dramaturgical metaphor, I created scene summaries for each of the sessions I attended. So that would keep me um, on track about what happened in each of these sessions. But I also created what I call a dialogical script. So I took my observations and I transformed them into a theatrical script. So I could look at interaction. What, what were people saying to each other? When? What was the setting like? What were the props used? So I created these, these scripts for myself, which, what, which is what I use for analysis. And then I basically did a fairly straightforward thematic analysis of the my observations in the group. But what I really want to get to is this piece of critical discourse analysis. Um, <clears throat> and as I said, I drew on Faircloth's work and his argument that a text should be analyzed by considering three aspects. The context in which the text is produced, and in this case it's a program manual, so I'm going to start using that language. The details of the manual, so what's in the manual. And the third, what do people do with this text? What do people do with this manual? So those were the three things that I had in mind. And I drew on a nursing researcher from New Zealand who approaches critical discourse analysis using a very nice, simple set of questions, which I have here. So she asks about producing the text, like how was it produced, why was it produced, when was it produced, who produced it? How is authority claimed in the text? to note something about the situation, and how are systems of knowledge and belief constructed, and social identities and social relations. So these questions were questions that I was asking as I analyzed this document. And I'm going to try and go through a little bit of it. I know we're, we never have as much time as I think we're going to have. Um, before I got into in-depth analysis of the text itself, I looked at things like, what did the text actually look like? Um, I began with a brief introduction to the manual to establish um, background information, a brief history of the text, give a good sense of what it looked like, as I said, how it was literally constructed, that it was in a three-ring binder, that it was on white pages. I, at the time, I didn't really know why this would matter, but this is what I was doing. Um, I looked at things like how the introduction described this. What was the purpose of this guide? And it said, it's a guide designated for adults to help children cope with a family member with mental illness. So that was important, seeing that, because I realized that this was for adults. This guide was not for the children. It was for the adults. And that, that had a particular resonance for me at that point in my analysis. I felt that it was especially useful for bringing trainee facilitators into alignment with the overall assumptions, principles, and practices of the program and to sustain a collective agreement about what they were supposed to do when they were doing these kinds of support groups. Uh, the, the program itself came, it contained a lot of educational information and strategies to support the kids. Um, there was kind of a working consensus, that's a, a Goffman word, working consensus, what we all agree to, 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 to claim about something, to deliver information in a particular way in a safe and non-judgmental place where kids could identify their feelings, and recognize they weren't alone and come to understand that they could cope with their situation. So that was all in my initial look at the document. It was developed um, by the main facilitator of the group I observed because she had done a lot of bereavement groups prior to developing this manual. So that, that was going to be an interesting influence on the document. And she also had her own experiences with parental mental illness, which she talks about in the document. The other thing about the document that was interesting just from looking at it was it was filled with sticky notes, things crossed out, 
So it was this kind of layering of information, of things that they had decided to change for that particular session anyway. So it came to see the document not just as this sort of fixed thing, but that in fact it was quite fluid. And um, in the interest of time, I was going to go through what some of these other parts of the document were, but I think I'm going to skip some of that. There were eight sessions in the group and a table of contents. And the table of contents was really interesting because it summarized the goals and activities of each of the sessions. So at this point, I felt like I was starting to see what some of the less implicit rules were about this group by looking at what the goals of the facilitators were. So for example, in session one, the goal was to establish relationships among the members, including the facilitators, to create an atmosphere where people could feel comfortable talking about mental illness. And then there were activities to fulfill those goals. So participant uh, introductions, children were encouraged to see that they were not alone. There were ground rules for the group that had to be established, keeping one another's confidentiality and the fact that in the introductory group they would start to introduce the idea or information about mental illness. And so I'll skip to session five, just to give you, an, it was slightly different. The goals here were to recognize that it's okay to be scared by the unpredictable behavior of a parent who has a mental illness, to recognize the physical signs of fear, to learn to work through fear, and the activities that are listed in this summarized content is to see that fears are manageable experiences, to separate symptoms from the person who's experiencing them, and then there are concrete demonst demonstrations that they were going to do with the kids to help them learn how to interpret feelings of fear. So there's an assumption that they don't know how to do that. Um, so that was the, the, each of the sessions had a very nice sort of summary and it helped me think a little bit more, as I say, about the rules of the group. But in terms of producing the text and going back, this is when I began sort of a deeper analysis of the text itself. And um, one of the things I looked at in thinking about how, how why, when uh, this, this uh, pro program was produced, I looked at the organizational context of, of the uh, text itself, like where did it come from, who, who did it belong to. Um, and the umbrella organization, which is a family organization helping people who have mental health problems, itself was nested within wider institutional arrangements. It was part of community-focused mental health promotion activities, um, and it was mandated to provide advocacy, education, counseling, referrals to family members. It was developed in 1989 in response to particular policy documents at the time that were trying to promote mental health in the community. So the children's group was nested within the large organization, which itself was nested, was nested within this much wider idea about mental health promotion. But the document was also produced, in my analysis, to help manage the group and the kids in it, and to help manage mental health information. In terms of managing the children, there are things in the document that talk about these children. So these children are a particular kind of children. Um, there's ideal group sizes, they talk about a safe location, they talk about how to make kids feel part of the group. So these are all management strategies that I think the document is intended to help the adult facilitators man do. But it's also about managing information. So there's specific tips and dialogue in the document. For anybody who's coming in as a trainee facilitator, they'd be able to read the document and presumably be able to conduct one of these groups. And, and it's actually, there's actually, it's just like a theatrical script, there's actually dialogue that's given to the facilitator. Um, and also, each of the sessions have very standardized formats. So there's an opening time, a working time, a closing time in each of the sessions, which became quite interesting to me, about how that was used to manage um, what was expected of the group. In terms of, the, so again, going back to my discourse analysis and Crow's questions, um, I asked of my analysis, how is authority to speak about mental health and illness and about being a child uh, established in this text? And how are connections made between discourses to support these claims that the text is making? And I'm going to read from this because it's a little bit dense. <laughs> um, in terms of, so I talk about the authority to speak through form and structure. 
The opening, working, and closing times provide a narrative structure to each session in which the facilitator can expect certain things to happen in an orderly, logical, timely, and linear fashion. Each session has a beginning, middle, and an end, which is dictated by the facilitators. The sequential unfolding of events gives rise to literal expectations about how activities will take place. But this narrative also operates more figuratively, suggesting how the story of the group is expected to go. The structure imposes these expectations. So for example, opening time is an opportunity to begin gathering personal information about the children and their lives outside of the group, and to provide an appropriate response to any outstanding questions that they might have had in other sessions. In this way, the facilitator can assess what Goffman calls information conditions that precede and influence the interactions that follow. So that was the opening time, and that's how I analyzed it, interpreted what was going on. The middle part of the narrative, or what, I, uh, what the program manual referred to as working time, this is where children learn about mental illness and how to express their feelings about it. The facilitator is directed to manage the participants and certain activities, and is given specific lines of dialogue to accomplish this. The narrative for each session concludes with a formal closing time in which children are expected to process what they've learned and facilitators answer any lingering questions, especially if they're running out of time, which they did all the time, often while they were eating the evening snack. As a kind of denouement, the tensions or conflicts associated with unanswered questions or difficulties processing information are supposed to be resolved before the children leave the session. This format is expected to be played out each and every week. Finally, the affirmation statement is used to conclude the narrative by making declarations about the children at the end of each session. This is meant to acknowledge children's knowledge and skills <clears throat> and their contributions to the session in order to encourage them and, as the manual said, build their self-esteem. These statements also encourage children, this is the Goffman, my Goffman take on it, these statements also encourage children's loyalty to the group by showing that they all have a part to play and reinforcing how they are learning to do this with confidence as disciplined pl discipline players who can trust their own performances. The other thing that was interesting about this document <clears throat> from this point of view was that the text had an unseen but seemingly omniscient narrator. So there was this voice operating in the background of all of this text that was directing everything, and in particular directing the adult facilitators. And it, meant, it was meant to be authoritative and, authoritative and knowledgeable about mental health and illness <coughs> in children, directing the facilitators to do and say certain things in a given activity. In this way, the facilitators are also managed, I argue, so that they can better handle the group by following rules about how emotions should be felt and expressed, learning an appropriate emotional vocabulary for these feelings, and learning to make connections between emotional elements to do with physiological arousal and situational events. So the unseen narrator, who I think is more familiar to, to those of you who studied literature prior to postmodernism, the unseen narrator is a very particular kind of character um, that we've learned to distrust. So I was thinking about that while I was analyzing this document as well. In terms, I'm not going to speak about the authority to speak through the content because that would take too long. Um, but just to know that there is a lot of professional claims that dominate in terms of the authority to speak. So there's lots of notions about accurate mental health information, lots of stuff around scientific knowledge and who. So the claims are made on that basis. Um, in terms of constructing systems of knowledge and belief, so again, back to my discourse analysis questions, what key concepts are developed in Bridges to Understanding? I don't think I mentioned that's the name of the manual. And how is value attributed to some ideas but not others? I want to take you quickly through an example of one phrase that's used around the idea of promoting mental health and preventing illness. So this is a phrase taken right out of the document. The phrase is, it's important that I feel safe all of the time. In my analysis, I parsed the sentence. So I looked at I, and here's what I wrote. 
By using the first person pronoun, the concept of feeling safe is immediately introduced as something highly individualized, personal, subjective, but natural. The idea that everyone feels things differently indicates that this will also be true of how they feel about feeling safe. Furthermore, because feelings are described as neutral and individuals' responses are unique, there are no right or wrong ways to feel about or respond to situations regardless of their similarity. In other words, feelings are not subject to evaluation or judgment as good and bad. And this is important because circumstances, which can be changeable and volatile like the weather, must be evaluated for safety. When things change, especially for the worse, feelings can help take the measure of a potentially dangerous situation. Emotions help individuals evaluate changes in their environment. When external circumstances are shifting in ways that aren't controllable, children are cast as able to learn to use what they feel, because feelings are neither good or bad. They're these uh, perfect um, uh, ways to measure the situation, to help them decide what to do. Second part of the sentence feel safe, so I feel safe. In this section, children are depicted as being responsible for feeling safe. They're told that they're supposed to protect themselves, not just from more obvious signs of danger or risk, but problems simply described as bad things might happen in the future. These dangerous or risky situations can be something catastrophic or an everyday event like falling off a bike. All risk is normalized by a prevention discourse in which planning is important for all kinds of problems and precautions must be taken, just like preparing to avoid a traffic accident. In essence, we all have to become circumspect performers, again a Goffman way of thinking, who plan for the possibility that bad things will happen. For children who have a parent with mental illness, this means taking precautions in the home that start with learning how to work through their fears, working through fears is a process of identifying them and learning to deal with them. So I feel safe. Sorry, that was supposed to be I feel safe all of the time. The, the concluding portion of the statement establishes the idea that children have the right to feel safe just like they have the right to accommodation, food, and clothing. Children's rights to feel safe, secure, and protected are presented as concomitant with their responsibility to take care of their health by learning how to manage their emotional responses to people and situations in order to prevent illness, especially illnesses due to the effects of prolonged expo exposure to stress. Most importantly, the individual who learns how to cope well is said to also learn how to exercise choice and control over his or her actions and behaviors. This is a fundament fundamental premise of Bridges to Understanding because a significant objective of the program is for each child to understand that they did not cause the illness, they can't cure or control it, but they can cope with it. Knowing the difference between what they can and cannot control is presented as part of learning how to cope with their situation. It's also part of learning, Goffman, how to act in a disciplined manner and manage life and take responsibility for one's own behaviors. Now, I'm a bit worried we're running out of time and I've gone, I think, a lot further than I thought. I didn't get quite as far as I wanted to. Um, but just suffice it to say that I also ask questions about how social identities and social relations are constructed in the text, how ways of being in the world um, are constructed by these particular discourses. And I found that there was very particular things said about how some adults are safe, while others are considered um, so some adults are safe, responsible, and trustworthy, and others are risk. So the kids are talked and taught about who these people are and how they're supposed to uh, respond to them. But similarly, there's lots of talk in the text about who these kids are and who they're supposed to be in their relationship to one another and to the adults in their lives. So all of this to say that there were performance implications for this discourse analysis that I was interested in understanding before, or in, in the context of the observations I had already made in the group. And these are some of the findings that I had from all of what I've been telling you about these, these questions that I asked of the script. So that there's the idea that real risk comes from prolonged exposure to frightening, unpredictable behavior. That these children are 
innately resilient but maladjusted and that to be healthy they have to learn to stop negative thinking and feel and learn to be safe. That children are expected to be competent managers of their own thoughts, feelings, and behaviors. And that they can be persons who have control, choice, and responsibility for how their story will unfold. And this is important because there's a, 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 a very strong emphasis that they're not to care and worry and look after their parent. And that by and the script also begins by positioning children as having a common identity that normalizes their experience and constructs their status as no longer alone. So those are the kinds of expectations that I found um, in looking at the, uh, the the script that I that I uh, came to to um, use in thinking about the rest of the analysis. Um, it's going on one o'clock, Joan. I still have quite a bit, and I'm not quite sure whether I should continue on or stop for questions about the discourse analysis. How, how much more do you have? Well, I, I could go on for a bit. I mean, what I, what I haven't done actually is talk about how the kids responded to this. Why don't you go on talking a bit? I know there's a bunch of people that have to leave. Yeah. So, so leave, and it's a bit disruptive. But yeah. Go on so, for a little bit. Yeah, okay. I apologize. I didn't realize. Yeah, okay. So, quite quickly, the group um, was seven kids. They were seven to 13. There were four males, three females. There were brothers and sisters in the group. Um, two facilitators and an ethnographer, that was me. Um, I wanted to show you quickly some photographs of the, uh, I always find it's really helpful for people to get a bit of a sense of what it was like to be there. Um, so this is the setting, it was in a large community recreational complex and we conducted the group in a little room at the end of that hall. Uh, this is what I call the stage. The kids sat around this table for the most part, although sometimes they actually shove the tables aside so that they could do physical activities. And you can see in one corner there's agenda paper, so there was always an agenda set up every day for, the, for our, every session. Props, lots of props used every day, to the extent that they had this sort of industrial dolly that they had to bring all their stuff in to perform uh, the activities. Some of the activities we did were things like drawing pictures of um, their parents when they're well, their parents when they're not well, and abstract uh, pictures of mental illness as, the, as they saw it. Some of the activities that we did, <clears throat> the uh, clothespin dolls were ways of trying to teach kids about their risk for inheriting mental illness, so statistical information. Um, the brown words on the paper are uh, a stigma, an anti-stigma session that we had where kids got to talk a little bit about the kinds of names that their parents are called and what they thought about that. So the results of the performance, I actually, in the thesis, there's two different chapters about results. The first one I call performing mental illness talk, and it's all about the kinds of things that kids said <clears throat> about what it meant to perform mental illness talk. Um, and in the first one, I'll just, uh, one of the boys said, all our moms have, have a problem. They had a really hard time using medicalized language. And a lot of them resisted medicalized language. And I make um, a point of this in the implications of my study to say that kids have um, a preference for talking about the situation in particular ways that are more relevant to them than medicalized language. And I think to support them, we have to think a little bit about what that might mean for them. Um, the second chapter of my results was what I call performing mental health talk. And this was, and I write according to each of these three um, categories. So talk about risk, talk about fear, and talk about safety. But what I really wanted to get to was to show you this little sample of what I call a dialogue. So this is the script, a transcription from my observations. And to give you a little sense of <clears throat> how I used it. Uh, so I'll just read it quickly. Martha is the facilitator, the adult facilitator, and the rest of, of the characters are, are the kids. So Mar this is the very opening sequence, the very first thing that's said in the group. <clears throat> Martha says, does anyone know why we're here tonight? And Elliot says, to bake a chocolate cake. And they're snickering all around the table. And she says, okay, okay, somewhat impatiently. Only one person speak at a time, you know, like school, but not school. And there's a pause. So if you look up here on this piece of paper, the agenda, you can see the kinds of things we'll be doing. Augusto, but, but when do we eat? Martha, what number on the agenda? 
Augusto ate, and then that's when we'll eat. Elliot pulls another chair up close and puts his feet on it, setting, settling him comfortably, while Augusto slides down into his seat, slipping three quarters of his face down into his jacket as if responding to the idea, uh-oh, things are getting serious now. Martha, continuing, you're all here tonight because someone in your family has a mental illness. What? Augusto says. And there's murmurs indicating the rest of the kids kind of understand what she's saying. And Martha ignores him and says, okay, okay, so let's, let's all say this together. And she brings her hands together in a, like a symphony conductor. I'm here because someone in my family has a mental illness. And in unison, they all, they all repeat after her. We're here because someone in our family has a mental illness. So I argue that before activities can get underway, the participants have to come to a formal agreement about what parental mental illness is and the reason that they've been brought together by acknowledging this, verbal, this verbally in the group. But I also argue that Elliot's sarcastic response suggests that he's unwilling to go along with her. And what I found interesting in my analysis is to wonder why. So. Um, I, I think, well, is he just sensing this as a rhetorical exercise, like a lot of adults ask us to do things and I'm just not going to do it? Um, and I, I thought it was really interesting that he resisted this by using this incongruous but funny image that allowed the other kids to laugh. Um, because I thought he was negotiating this opening sequence without giving too much away about what he really thought or felt about coming to this group. And there's something I didn't mention, is that most of the kids don't want to be there. It's a, it's a pretty stressful situation. The strategy helps him avoid a direct question from Martha, but it also demonstrates to everyone else present that he has his, his suspicions about this group, and the agenda, and the expectations of the situation. Because it's probably not anything so innocuous as baking a chocolate cake. And it seems to garner him some social capital from the others who snicker in response, and although it isn't clear that they feel that way, this suppressed form of laughter and its sarcastic edge suggests that they are with him at least this far. So his performance has come off, and he's brought the others along with him. But Martha's reaction is swift as she remains, as she moves to regain control, imposing sort of ambiguous school but not school rules, and easily dispensing with Augusto's challenge by pointing to the agenda and saying that's how things will go. I also argue that the refrain, we're all here because we have a parent with a mental illness, does more to aid the development of group solidarity by teaching the new members what's expected of a loyal, disciplined participant, and by teaching them that they have a moral obligation to one another because they're all kids whose parents are mentally ill. Uh, I was going to tell you a bit about this photograph, which I use in a lot of my presentations, but I'll just be really quick about it. It was an activity that they had to do in this same session. And they had to put things that they had in common in the boat, or I can't remember if it was the other way, things that were different about them outside the boat. And Colin, who was, again, a very articulate young man, and who drew the boat for us, I didn't realize until I was reviewing my photographic field notes later of this activity that he had actually written the word Titanic. <laughs> up in the corner of the picture. And I just want to say quickly something about that because, well, let me say, this is, humor became a really interesting management strategy that the kids used. And I make something of that in the thesis. And I argued that humor was a strategy to manage expectations and to manage being identified and classified as kids who are all in the same boat. Here's what Goffman says about humor, though. Given the dangers of expression, Oh, a disguise may function not so much as a way of concealing something, but as a way of revealing what can be tolerated in an encounter. So we're not hiding something, we're showing something about what we hide. That's basically his point. He said, we, fan we fence our encounters in with gates. The very means by which we hold off part of reality can be the means by which we bear introducing it. And I, I particularly like that quote because I think in the kids' humor management strategies to pull off being successful kids who have parents that are mentally ill, they use humor to deal with really difficult emotions. But they also, so in this example, I argue that they can refer to their situation as being the Titanic, something quite um, disastrous, no hope, um, really challenging the adult facilitators right off the get-go, don't tell me this is going to be okay. 
but they do it without having to confront those ideas directly, which to me is a fascinating strategy. Um, I think, and I summarize all of this nicely in the end of the thesis by talking about um, how being identified as all in the same boat was meaningful, but it also was consequential to the kids. Um, so it was meaningful because they were expected to learn particular things about mental health and illness because of the assumption that knowledge is power. And I, I talk a little bit about how knowledge, in fact, is not power, always, or it's a particular kind of power. And so the assumption that if we just shove enough information at someone, they're going to have power is actually not necessarily a supportive thing to do. And the kids had a lot of resistances to this that I, I use as evidence for that. Um, they're also expected to express their feelings about what it's like to be a, a child in this situation. But in, in doing that, it's used to help them manage only their own lives. As I said earlier, there's this real stricture around any idea that they would be responsible for or want to or should help their parents. So the whole point of this group is to get them to move on from the situation, even though they actually can't. So I think there's some real interesting ramifications for those expectations. Um, I always like to conclude my presentations with something that the kids said to me privately, one of them in particular, um, because I think that sometimes some of this can come off as if it was all negative, and I don't think it was. Um, but one of the kids said that they thought the group was great because it showed a real interest about this, so obviously they want this talked about. But they also saw themselves as the teachers. So they saw themselves as people who had valuable knowledge. And I think that's interesting because the assumptions about, about bridges to understanding are the assumptions that many of us make and that, that kids are the students and they have to learn and we're going to support them and everything's going to be fine. When in fact, they see themselves as having something to offer. Uh, and I shared this with Martha quite recently. Martha always gets a really bad rap from my presentations because often people read my work and think that she is a real control freak and that she, you know, they don't get a, a, a sense of Martha and I think I have to bear some responsibility for that. But I showed her this quote and she, she, took, she took great heart in the fact that the kids found it helpful from this perspective and that they saw themselves as having something to teach her. So I was quite happy about that. I always include something from Colin. This, the kids were upset that I couldn't photograph them, which I think is interesting. So I agreed to, to photograph Colin from the neck down. This is the kid with the Titanic. And I think as a qualitative researcher, that's a perfect slide. Um, so in concluding, I return to my methodological uh, haiku and leave it to you to decide whether all of what I said and the script that I didn't even get halfway or probably three quarters of the way, I did get three quarters of the way through, is something necessary or, you know, could you say that in terms of this haiku you kind of understand a little bit about not only the idea that, perform that critical dramaturgy is about performances because they are about strategic interaction, but they're also about language at work and how those two things work together. So, oh, I know what, I have to do this. I want to thank my committee, um, particularly my co-supervisors, Patricia McKeever, Catherine Boydell, and Mary Seaman, my cast, and the producers or funders of, of, of this work. So thank you for your attention. Um, sorry that I couldn't, uh, that I went over a bit, but um, yes, Denise. Can you go back to the haiku? To the, slide. the haiku, yes. yes. Thank you. And? I just want to read again. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Well, thank you. Thank you.